Hello Merfolk fans, Joe here. Thanks very much for joining me today. I'm here with a replay of a match I had against a red-white Blood Moon deck. But before I jump into the match, I want to spend a couple of minutes just discussing Blood Moon in relation to modern Merfolk. Now, when, when Merfolk players are constructing their mana bases, almost uniformly, my impression is that uh, they're not only hedging against powerful effects that can really blow us out, like Choke and Boil, but they're also hedging against Blood Moon. And I'm here to tell you guys that it's not something that you need to do. Blood Moon is pretty much never a card that Modern Merfolk needs to be concerned with, all right? So let, let's see um, if, I, if I can convince you. That's going to be my goal in this video. So when people bring Blood Moon uh, in Modern, what are they trying to do with it? What's their goal? What's their premise? And obviously, there's a lot of very greedy mono bases in Modern. If we take Jund as an example, they play pretty uniformly two swamps and then either one forest or two forests. And the reason they uh, play basics at all is usually uh, to play around Blood Moon and also uh, to be able to fetch some lands in response to um, Path to Exile. If their creature gets exiled, they want to be able to get a land. So some lists play one four, some lists play two fours. In general, I'd say the average is about three and a half basics in their entire deck. Now that is a mono base that Blood Moon can totally destroy. All right. Now if you look at my mono base, I've got seven basic islands. That's exactly double as many as Jun plays. That's it's double. Okay. So imagine a deck plays you know four pieces of removal and another deck plays eight pieces of removal. It's a lot more. Okay. I have seven basics. So if a person playing Blood Moon saw the composition of my mana base and you ask them, you know, would you keep Blood Moon in against this deck? I have to think that most players would probably sideboard out Blood Moon. Uh, it's just too many basics. There's just too high of a chance that we're going to draw into one or more of our basics. All right. So to start, a mono color deck is virtually never going to be greedy enough for Blood Moon to have a big effect against. All right. So Moving on, <coughs> there's a ton of spells in our deck, the vast majority, that can be safely resolved off of a single uh, dedicated blue source, uh, like a basic island, basically. So if we look you know, what those spells are, we have four Curse Catchers, four Masters of Waves, four Mara Regery, and four Silver Gill Adept. That's 16 out of the 29 creatures. It's, it's over half of my creatures that only need access to one blue mana. So out of these seven islands, I really only, only need to draw one if I'm playing against Blood Moon. If we look at the non-creature spells in the deck, Spreading Seas only requires one blue, Echoing Truth only requires one blue, Dismember only requires one of any color, one generic mana, or it can be colorless, and Aether Vial also, one generic mana. Okay, so if we add that all up, it was um, 16 creatures, Seven non-creatures here, four up there, that's 11. 16 plus 11, is, so 27 of my 40 spells, 27 of the 40 spells can be cast with just one of these islands. And I've got seven of them in the deck. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar with magic math, uh, that is a pretty safe ratio, um, okay? If we look at the, the spells that require more than that, you know, most people's perception of modern merfolk is, or merfolk in any format, is that it runs all double blue spells. But in reality, it's just the eight Island Walk Lords, four Harbingers of the Tides in my particular build, and one Kira Great Glass Spinner for a total of 13 spells that require uh, two dedicated blue mana. All right, now if the opponent does resolve a Blood Moon and I do draw one or fewer basic islands, in those cases, I still have four Aether Vials in the deck. Okay, this card is the ultimate trump against Blood Moon. Uh, it lets us get creatures out every single turn, regardless of what they're doing to our mana, okay? And remember, whereas Choke doesn't let us untap our lands, or Boil destroys our lands, Blood Moon, it just sits there and changes the type. And we don't really care about that. We're still going to get to untap our lands, still get to use mana. Imagine I have one island and three Muta Vaults. I'm still going to resolve Masters of Waves all day. And if the opponent is playing a deck with Blood Moon, uh, they're playing, probably playing a lot of red removal, and Master of Waves you know, doesn't care about that stuff. He has protection from red. All right, so if I haven't convinced you guys yet, I'll go ahead and get into the match itself. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close this. And um, I was playing against this guy. So open up the match, and we'll get started with the replay. So please, the point that I'm trying to get across here is that while building our deck, 
Blood Moon needs to be the furthest thing, uh, you know, from a consideration. We just really, really don't have to think about it at all, okay? So let's see, you know, how this match went, and hopefully I can prove that point to you guys. Looking at my opening hand, looks fantastic. I have two of those non-basic blue producing sources. Cavern of Souls is excellent. I always enjoy seeing it uh, against an unknown opponent. Uh, Ether Vial, always great in the opening hands. Curse Catcher, Lord of Atlantis, and Mera Regery for a curve of 1, 2, 3. And Spreading Seas to disrupt the opponent's mana, give us Island Walk, and draw cards. Really excellent, sort of ideal, picturesque, merfolk opening hand. On the opponent's side of things, it's a little hard to see what their strategy is, but you know we've got a lot of hints. Um, Plains and Mountain, uh, two lands. He's going to want to draw another, so he'll be able to land Blood Moon, which I'm pretty sure is uh, a very important card uh, to this deck's uh, plan. Only decks that uh, really need Blood Moon, or I guess... When you play Blood Moon, you tend to build around it, I should say. Um, two Lightning Bolts, fantastic against Merfolk, should do a lot of work in this game. Uh, Goblin Dark Dwellers can recur one of those Lightning Bolts, or any other removal spell that uh, goes to the graveyard at any point. And looking at Emrakul, we're going to have to assume that he's uh, playing Nahiri in the deck. Looks like a probable keep on the opponent's side. Definitely a keep on my side. So the opponent plays a Mountain and passes. I draw a basic island, but not knowing the opponent's playing uh, Blood Moon, I'll just start with Oboro and put Aether Vial out. As I mentioned, Aether Vial is the ultimate trump against Blood Moon. I can keep putting creatures out, regardless of what color mana my lands are producing. The opponent plays a Plains. And with uh, two untapped lands up, red and white, I'm thinking, you know, he's probably representing Lightning Bolt, Lightning Helix, and Path to Exile. So it doesn't seem uh, very welcoming for my creatures at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and put uh, Spreading Seas into play and try to take him off of red. Uh, this will allow me to draw into a card, um, develop uh, my own strategy with more information about uh, what spells I have uh, available to me while... Um, seeing more of what the opponent is trying to do against me. It's a big turn for the opponent. He gets to resolve Blood Moon, which as I mentioned has to be a really important card uh, in most of his matchups. And you'll see against me, it's utterly useless. All right, so I bring in Curse Catcher with the Aether Vial at the end of my opponent's turn. I'll take it up to two. Draw Harbinger of the Tides. I've got a lot of creatures. I just need to get some of them out onto the battlefield and start swinging. So Blood Moon is out. Cavern of Souls actually doesn't have any of this text on it anymore. I don't have to name a creature type, so I actually just put Mountain on the card so I remember that it's a red source. Um, but I still have this basic island. I'll be able to uh, produce blue mana. And Mera Regery looks like a really great choice right now. So I'll play that guy and swing for two with the Curse Catcher. The opponent goes from 20 down to 18. I choose not to bring in the Lord of Atlantis right now, just to play around uh, Anger of the Gods. Definitely a card that a deck running Blood Moon and all of these mountains uh, could be running in the main deck. All right, so at the end of the opponent's turn, I'm going to activate Aether Vial, and in response, he's going to cast Lightning Bolt targeting Mera Regery. Nothing I can do about that, so the Regery dies. And at this point, I'm going to bring in the Harbinger of the Tides rather than, say, the Lord, because this way I'll be able to actually push more damage this turn, because uh, the Lord's effect... Uh, can apply to these guys, and they'll be able to attack this turn. I drew into a Master of Waves, which is uh, one of the best cards in this kind of a matchup. With my one blue source, I'll be able to uh, cast Silver Gull Adept, revealing that Lord of Atlantis, draw into another Spreading Seas, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and activate Aether Vial here to bring in that Lord of Atlantis and go to uh, attacks. I attempt to swing for five with Harbinger and Curse Catcher, but the opponent casts another Lightning Bolt, taking out my lord. He'll take three, going from 18 down to 15, and untap. The opponent continues drawing lands. They tap five of them, resolving a Goblin Dark Dwellers, um, recurring a Lightning Bolt, attempting uh, to get rid of my Harbinger of the Tides. At this point, with all of this mana, I'm going to sacrifice Curse Catcher uh, to counter that Lightning Bolt, keeping my two-power creature on the table. Curse Catcher's effect... Uh, pretty much loses its impact once the opponent has so many lands on the on the table. I'm going to leave Aether Vial on two because I'm pretty close to having the four lands I need to resolve Master of Waves. Didn't get it this turn, but I'll be able to um, use that one blue mana to put another Spreading Seas on one of his lands. I can go ahead and hit his planes. Uh, as it stands, it's the only white mana he has access to. 
I draw a Wanderwine hub, which enters the battlefield as a non-basic mountain. So uh, I don't have to reveal a Merfolk for it to come in untapped. And um, with no Island Walk online or anything, I'm just going to go ahead and pass the turn to the opponent. They'll untap. They draw another land and pass the turn back to me. I'm not going to bring in the Harbinger of the Tide yet, just because he might come in handy later. I'll advance this Aether Vial to 1, and I draw into Akira. Now, I don't have access to 2 blue mana yet, um, because these 3 are non-basic mountains, but now I can resolve this Master of Waves. I think for a moment about whether or not I want to bring this Harbinger in before uh, trying to resolve the Master of Waves to get more Devotion on the board. But as it stands, once Master enters, I'll have 6 Devotion, making uh, 12 power of tokens. So then if I attack uh, next turn, uh, the opponent will not have blocks to prevent lethal. So I decide that just um, committing Master of Waves to the board with 6 elementals is the way to go. The opponent drew an Anger of the Gods, so um, that was a good decision on my part because I get to keep this Harbinger in my hand. So there's that Anger. It's going to kill everybody except the Master of Waves who can start attacking through this Goblin Dark Dwellers because of his protection from red. On my turn, I untap, advance both of the Aether Vials, and um, draw into another Master of Waves. Probably the best possible top deck there. Uh, fearing future uh, Lightning Bolts, future Paths to Exile, I'm going to go ahead and bring Kira, Great Glass Spinner, in. And then when I resolve this next Master of Waves, after swinging for two with protection from red with this Master of Waves, I'm going to have uh, exactly those six Elemental Tokens again. Now, unless the opponent draws exactly another Anger of the Gods, or get or resolves another Goblin Dark Dwellers, I guess, um, to recur this Anger of the Gods, he's not going to be able to do much against this board state. This is what happens when you play Emrakul. You end up drawing it. You don't draw your Nahiri, you, you'll draw Emrakul every time. So I'll untap, draw Spreading Seas, see no reason not to go ahead and play that and see some information on what card I draw. I hit a Curse Catcher, can't play that guy right now because these are mountains. But I can turn all my guys sideways, and he can block one of my two power, but then I have eight more of them. So he's going to take 16 in this spot. We can see he has no more removal, and he decides to scoop it up. So in that game, the opponent resolved an early Blood Moon, uh, had two Lightning Bolts, uh, a Goblin Dark Dwellers to recast one of those Lightning Bolts, and we still just walked all over him. Blood Moon is terrible against Merfolk. Please don't ever be afraid about playing against Blood Moon. So let me hang on a second here. Um, opening hands looked good on both sides. I mean, my hand is an obvious keep. On his side, uh, we don't know exactly what he's trying to do, um, but he had, it looks like, one, two, three lands. Another Goblin Dark Dwellers. This time we can see he's playing some land destruction in the form of Boom Bust and two Simeon Spirit Guides. A lot of these land destruction decks play these Simeon Spirit Guides, and I'm pretty much never sad to see these cards, right? Because if we think about it, the opponent's opening hand is, in a very real sense, comprised only of five actual cards, right? And then he has a, a two red mana over here. So um, the Boom Bust can do some work. It can destroy some of my lands, and I don't have access to Aether Vial right now. And uh, for those of you unfamiliar with this card, the people who tend to play it uh, always are looking to abuse it as much as possible. So it says destroy target land you control, and target land you don't control. So, of course, he plays a lot of lands uh, that can play around that effect. So if he plays Boom Bust targeting um, Arid Mesa and one of my islands, then uh, he gets to sacrifice the Arid Mesa in response, and then that target becomes invalid for Boom Bust. So he won't have to actually destroy one of his lands. Sacrifice Arid Mesa, get another land, and destroy my land, all for two mana, is a pretty solid effect. So fetch lands work great with Boom Bust. Flagstones of Trocare also work really great. And when this card goes into a graveyard, uh, the controller gets to go ahead and get a tapped planes out of his deck. So pretty much the same effect as a fetch land uh, with regards to uh, Boom Bust. So my hand was a keep, as I mentioned. I go ahead and draw a second Merorigiri. Never unhappy to see those guys. I'll play an island, knowing that the opponent is on Blood Moon at this point. And uh, he draws an Anger of the Gods. That's an excellent card against Merfolk, obviously. He's going to exile one of those Simeon Spirit Guides and cast Boom targeting his Arid Mesa. He's going to sacrifice it in response. And he'll get to go and get a tapped Sacred Foundry from that. And I lose my, my only land. But I've got some more. And I draw it into an Aether Vial. So again, we see 
how good Merfolk is set up against these types of decks. I'll play my basic island, get Aether Vial on the table, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. The opponent draws Emrakul again, which obviously he doesn't want to do. He probably wants to cheat that thing into play. He can't cast Goblin Dark Dwellers yet. Anger of the Gods doesn't do anything yet. So I'll untap, put a counter on Aether Vial, and draw into another land. Uh, with Spreading Seas, only requiring one. Mara Regery, Master of Waves, the other Mara Regery, only requiring one blue mana. I'm set on that. Feeling, feeling very good in this spot. And with all this mana up, I'm going to go ahead and cast Spreading Seas just like last game. This time targeting the Rugged Prairie because uh, with this board state, Rugged Prairie is the only card that's giving him access to double red. Uh, if I hit the Sacred Foundry, he could still tap the Flagstones to uh, pay for Rugged Prairie with white mana, and that would produce double red. Uh, so this helps play around Anger of the Gods. Um, I didn't know about the second Simeon Spirit Guide at this point, but I think that was the best target uh, with Spreading Seas in that position. I drew into a second Master of Waves, which pretty ecstatic about. Pass back to the opponent, and he draws a Blood Moon. Still has nothing to do with the Simeon Spirit Guide, and with no other real choices, he goes ahead and plays Blood Moon giving me time to advance my Aether Vial and play more lands. Aether Vial will go to 2. Draw a Dismember, not very useful in the matchup. I play a Wanderwine Hub and reveal a creature, though I didn't have to. Um, it, was, it actually just enters the battlefield as a mountain. Doesn't have the text about having to reveal a Merfolk. It doesn't matter in the end, I reveal Marowegery and cast Marowegery. The opponent uh, drew into another Boom Bust. Looks like they're probably going to cast that here. And there it is. Boombust's going to kill Flagstones of Trocare and my island. The opponent go gets to go and get a, um, a Tapped Plains. Passes the turn. At the end of his turn, I'm going to bring in a Lord. And on my turn, I'll get to advance the Aether Vial and put in another Mero Regery, getting outside of Lightning Bolt, outside of Anger of the Gods range. At this point in this game, I definitely just want to look to push damage. So I'll, I'll bring that Mero Regery in, getting outside of the range of Anger of the Gods, and swing for 8. The opponent goes down to 11 and is facing lethal already next turn. Draws another land. It's going to get to resolve this Dark Dwellers at this point. But doesn't really have a lot of great spells to recur. He can take me off Island Walk by destroying his Rugged Prairie. And that seems like a reasonable choice. Because uh, as it stands then I won't be able to swing in with this Lord. Because he would get blocked uh, by the Goblin Dark Dwellers. They'll probably still be to my benefit to trade with the Dark Dwellers because I can just lean on him the following turn. Aether Vial gets ticked up to 4, and I draw another island. As I mentioned in my opening, I play 7 islands, and so of course I'm going to expect to draw some uh, at some point. The opponent with his boom, all of his boom busts, all of his blood moons, just totally unable to deal with 7 basic islands and 4 Aether Vials. So as you guys can see, I can either dismember the Dark Dwellers and swing for 12 and win, or I can cast the Curse Catcher, tap the Dark Dwellers, attack for 12 and win. But as it stands, I have some fun plays. So I'm going to bring in a Master of Waves. Uh, I'll make, I think at this point, 5 Elementals. If I cast Curse Catcher, I get to tap his Dark Dwellers with one Regery, untap my Aether Vial with, <laughs> with the other Mero Regery uh, to bring in a Master of Waves at the opponent's end step if he happens to get that far. Um, I'm not playing with the opponent. I think for a moment I just uh, was thinking these guys were 3 threes and wanted to leverage uh, the value that I had on the board with the Mero Regeries. At this point, of course, I've realized that I have 12 power and uh, the opponent scoops it up. So, in my view, uh, sure, the opponent drew a lot of lands in game one, but he drew an Anger of the Gods in game two. He drew a, he drew a bunch of Boom Busts along with Fetch Lands and Flagstones of Trocare. He drew Goblin Dark Dwellers. Uh, he seemed to get cards, uh, decent cards, as far as you know this deck goes. Um, but this kind of a strategy, any strategy that is centered around resolving Blood Moon, is always going to be terrible against modern merfolk. So please, guys, um, feel comfortable running more non-basic blue sources uh, because we need to care far, far more about choke and boil than we do about Blood Moon. You guys should be running fewer than 10 basic islands because 10 or more and you're, you're just looking to get blown out by choke or boil. Those cards are really potent and they exist in the format. Uh, if Blood Moon exists, don't think about it, please. Just forget that it exists and smile uh, and maybe chuckle a little bit when, when an opponent gets one of these on the board. So that's it. Please, if you have any questions or comments, uh, share them on the video. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. 
Thanks very much again for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.